Welcome, friends, to another edition of Economic Update, a weekly program devoted to the economic dimensions of our lives, our jobs, our incomes, our debts, and those coming down the road for us and for our children. I'm your host, Richard Wolff. I've been a professor of economics all my adult life, and I hope that that has prepared me for presenting these economic insights to you. As usual, we start with a very few brief announcements. For those of you who have kindly offered to be supportive of what we do, I want to urge you, to, the simplest way to do that is to go to patreon.com, P-A-T-R-E-O-N. Uh, and there you can see this program as a TV program and uh, express whatever support you have in mind. I also want to thank you for making use of our websites. We maintain them 24-7, no charge whatsoever, and they allow you to communicate with us what you like and don't about this program, to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, and in general to make use of the materials we upload literally every day to help us reach even more people through your partnership, which is a goal of this program. And finally, I want to remind everyone that we now have an arrangement with a Speakers Bureau. It's called speakoutnow.org, located in Oakland, California. If you're interested in having me come to speak to an organization uh, in your area, which I would enjoy doing, please get in touch with them. The easiest way to do that is to email them at info at speakoutnow.org. Let's then jump into our updates for today. Recently, uh, the Christian Science Monitor did an interesting report that came to me as a reminder of what a recovery in economics should be, but isn't. And I'm talking about the recovery, in quotation marks, today. Millennials, that famous group that we're all talking about now, young people basically, have been studied, and in the way that the Christian Science Monitor did it, have been studied in terms of how their economic fortunes compare with that of their parents when the parents were the same age as the millennials are today. And the result I found extraordinary. First, millennials today are getting 20% less income than their parents got at the same age, adjusting for the prices. In other words, the children are 20% less well off financially than are the parents, or rather than the parents were at the same age. It's interesting that millennials not only earn less than the so-called baby boomers, but they are hampered by much higher rates of student debt, and they are much less likely than their parents to own their own homes. As the Christian Science Monitor points out, the notion that hard work and studying will get you ahead of where your parents were, that's not true anymore. They're working harder, they're studying longer, but between the debts they have to incur to study longer, they're not earning anywhere near what their parents earned. And since the pensions that their parents were able to get, which guaranteed them a certain amount of income after they reached 30, uh, 65, the current group of millennials either have no pension at all, or have what's called a 401k plan, which depends on how much money you put in, and how well it does in the stock market, which means at the very least that your future is more precarious as well as poorly, more poorly paid than that of your parents. The notion of the upward and onward quality of life in America is being destroyed person by person, month by month, and this study in the Christian Science Monitor documents it. The lesson here is that an economic system like ours has not built into it every generation does better than the one before. That was true for much of American history until the 1970s. It's over. 
it's not coming back, and the direction is the opposite. Let me turn now to a perennial, but one that cannot be overly discussed. The health care crisis, and I'm an economist, so we're going to look at it from an economic point of view. You can imagine that if one is interested in health care and how it's financed, that I would have had my attention really riveted when I picked up the Bloomberg News on August 2nd, 2017, and read the following headline. I'll read it to you now. Americans die younger despite spending the most on health care. That's what the headline in the Bloomberg News Service, that service that is used by virtually every financial institution in the United States, that's what they said. Article was by Lori Meisler, and I urge you to read it if you have the time to go check out uh, the Bloomberg archive. Here are some of the basic findings that she had. The United States does poorly in terms of longevity. The OECD, uh, which ranks the 30 or 40 most developed economic uh, countries in the world, ranks the United States 27th when it comes to life expectancy. Keep in mind, we pay more for our health care than anywhere on earth, but 26 countries, all of whom spend less on their health care than we do, have people living longer. But that's the least of it. Listen to this. We have the fourth highest infant mortality rate of all the countries in the OECD. We have the sixth highest maternal mortality rate and the ninth highest likelihood of dying at a younger age from a host of ailments, including cardiovascular disease and cancer. In one ranking, we are at the top of the list. Here's what it is. We are the most obese country in the OECD. We lead in drug-related death, and we rank 33rd in the prevalence of diabetes. And here comes something the article really stunned me with. 88% of Americans say they are in good or very good health. By contrast, the Japanese, who have the highest life expectancy in the OECD, only 35% of the Japanese think they are in good health. It is a wonderful testimony to what you can make people believe and how different it can be from what they actually experience. Well, when the Bloomberg survey in this article asks the obvious question, with these poor or mediocre results in terms of the quality of our health, why are we paying way more than anybody else on this planet? They mentioned in this article as one big reason the cost of drugs and of medicines, which are higher in this country than in all the other OECD countries. And the question is, well, why? How is that possible? How can drug companies get away with charging more here than the same country does for the same medicine elsewhere, sometimes just across the border in Canada to our north or in Mexico to our south. And there my attention was caught by a recent article in the New York Times, which pointed out very cleverly that there's a whole problem in the United States of drug companies requiring doctors, hospitals, and drug distributors to push onto the clients, you and me, brand name drugs, even after what are called generics. When a brand name drug's patent runs out, then other companies can produce the same drug much, much more cheaply. And they do. Those are called generics. They're the exact chemical equivalent of whatever the brand name was. They don't carry the brand name, 
and they sell for the cost of production, which is typically a small fraction of what the brand name drug sells for. Well, it turns out the drug companies cut deals with the doctors and the hospitals and the drug distributors to push the brand name on the client to force it in some cases, to just urge it, to give kickbacks. One of the companies named was CVS Caremark as a distributor who has deals with the drug makers to try to push brand name drugs. Well, I'd like to summarize the message here. Medical care in our country is a monopoly operated by four industries that work together, hospitals, doctors, the insurance companies, medical insurance companies, and finally, the drug and device makers. Those four help each other, like we just illustrated with a drug company working in cahoots with an insurance company to get the insurance company or the doctor or the hospital to push the brand name drugs. And you can be sure that the drug companies do good things for them in return together. They make the cost of medical care higher in the United States, even though the quality of the medical care we get is mediocre or poor. And in any case, much poorer than that in many countries which do not allow such a monopoly to function. The next economic update uh, takes me back to a topic I have addressed before. This has to do with the automobile companies, and in particular, the German automobile companies. Now, they have been caught and have admitted to fouling the air by deliberately installing in their diesel cars devices that fake the emissions during the emissions test so that you could get on the road millions of their cars that are polluting the air because they have fooled the emissions control that is trying to be made. This has so enraged people around the world at being systematically damaged by this fraudulent, profit-driven behavior of the big automobile companies in Germany. Above all, Volkswagen, but the others are caught in it too, uh, Mercedes-Benz and others. It has led a number of places in the world to say they don't trust these companies anymore. They don't want to have anything to do with diesel since that's where this was done. So you have across Europe uh, cities that are banning all diesel vehicles. Athens in Greece has done that. Madrid in Spain has done that. And that is pushing a development which the German car companies, and you have to give them some respect for the sheer audacity here, they are pushing against that. They are lobbying and spending money and effort to prevent cities from banning the diesel. Second thing they're doing, which I find amazing and again audacious, is they don't want to install devices on all the old diesel cars, which would stop them from doing the pollution that they've gotten away with. But instead, they want to give rebates for people to trade in the old diesel for a new one. That's asking the world to trust them after the reasonableness of trusting them has been proven by them to not exist. What is going on here? What are the lessons in this ongoing horrible story out of the German automobile industry? Number one, they put profit above human health. There's no nice way to say it, and why should one bother? It's important to look this truth in the face. They made a decision that was good for their company's profits. The fact that it polluted the air for millions of people, Germans included, wasn't enough to prevent them from doing it. You have to stop and let that horrible truth sink in. Number two, the German government is in a very cozy relationship with the car companies. It's the largest industry in the country, so it isn't very surprising. 
There was a recent, a recent case where a leading social democratic party uh, official, the social democratic party is uh, often in a coalition government with Angela Merkel's uh, Christian Democratic Union Party. He was caught having given a speech he gave on the floor of parliament to VW to look at before he gave it, as if VW has the final word on what is said by a leading politician. That's called a cozy relationship in which the business helps the politician and vice versa. But the point is not that they're doing that, that's bad enough, but that they're doing it at the expense of the people they sell the cars to and the people who they're supposed to represent as their elected leaders. And yet, there's a good point here too, and a good lesson. Massive anger of the mass of people, that's what is stopping this. The people were able to get the politicians in Athens and Madrid to ban those uh, diesel automobiles. They were able to hit back. They were able to teach a lesson to these companies that you can get caught, you will pay a heavy price, your whole business of diesel automobiles looks to be over in the world, they're not going to trust you anymore. You took a chance in behaving to, in the way your profits dictated. Maybe you oughtn't to. And maybe for us the lesson is, why do we allow profits to be the driver of what companies do? Maybe we ought to have companies run by a kind of mixed board. People who work in the company and the people they're supposed to serve the customer together having their representatives on the board. So nothing happens that privileges one of them at the expense of the other because they're both in on the key decisions together. Well, that's the idea behind a co-op, especially a co-op that includes not only the workers in the plants, in the factories, but the people who live around them, who live with the consequences of what they do, the customers who live with the consequences of the product they produce. Let the people who have a stake in what these companies do run them. The stakeholders, all of them, not a tiny group who can profit at the expense of everybody else. The last economic update we will have time for today is also one with rich lessons for us. The story is about something that happened recently in Little Rock, Arkansas. A city I don't talk about that often, but here it's a very important story. In the late 1990s, as happened in so many parts of the United States, Eastern Arkansas saw the disappearance of thousands and thousands of jobs as manufacturing of textiles and other things basically shut down and the jobs were moved overseas where workers could be paid much, much less than those workers were paid then. It plunged Little Rock, the whole state of Arkansas, but particularly eastern Arkansas, into a depression that has lasted the last 20 years made worse by the collapse in 2008, but from which no recovery has been possible. Thus it was with great fanfare that the governor of uh, Arkansas announced in Little Rock the wonderful news that the Tian Yuan, I apologize for my Chinese pronunciation, the Tian Yuan Garments Company of Suzhou signed an agreement recently uh, to buy an old factory in Little Rock to refit it with new technology so that it would become a fully automated t-shirt production line, ultimately producing 800,000 t-shirts a day to be sold to the main customer of Tian Yuan Garments Company, namely the Adidas Corporation that I'm sure most of you know about. Proudly, the chairman of 
Tian Yuan garments, announced that they will be producing one t-shirt every 22 seconds with this marvelous new machinery. And now I'm going to read you the announcement this chair of the company, the Chinese company, announced a statement he made when he announced this with the governor. Quote, Around the world, even the cheapest labor market can't compete with us. I am really excited about this, he said. Well, let me make sure everybody understands what this means, what the message here is. First, companies producing t-shirts and many other things were providing the living, a decent living, for many thousands of Arkansas residents. Then they left, moved to China, made a lot more money by paying workers there a lot less, enjoyed those profits for 20 years, while the families, the people, the economy, the neighborhoods, the cities of eastern Arkansas declined and suffered the decline of so many in America. Now, after 20 years, the governor is all excited about the return of a factory, once again making t-shirts in eastern Arkansas. How many jobs will it produce? They hope within four years, 400 jobs. What will be the average pay? And when I tell you this, I hope you gasp the way I did when I read it. $14 an hour. That's what the people of Arkansas can look for. They lost thousands of jobs paying well suffered 20 years, and are now supposed to be overjoyed the way their governor was when they're going to get, over four years, 400 jobs at $14 an hour. But the story isn't over. In order to get the company to settle in Little Rock, Arkansas gave them the following. $1.6 million a year for each of the next five years as a tax reduction. Hmm, that means they won't have to pay the taxes they would otherwise have had to pay to the state of Arkansas so it can do things. But we're still not done. $1 million in a straight-out cash subsidy. Half a million for worker retraining. Do have to do a lot of retraining for a work that pays $14 an hour. They were also given, as part of this deal, by both Little Rock and the Pulaski County, of which Little Rock is a part, a cut of 65% in the property tax they would have had to pay. If you own land and a factory in Arkansas, you have to pay property tax to the city and the county where it's located. But 65% of that tax, they won't have to pay. Now, friends, let's be clear. If you give them a subsidy, that's money the state of Arkansas or the city of, Ar of Little Rock can't use for all the other things it needs to do. If you give them a break, if you give them a subsidy, you either have to tax other people to find that money or you have to stop spending that money on other things in order to make it available. So the people of Arkansas are paying really well, not just the 20 years of economic decline with the interrupted lives and the interrupted educations and the collapsed infrastructure and the poor schools that that meant. But now they're looking forward to having to spend money, taxpayer money, they gave to the state for the things they need to give a subsidy to a company that's going to bring them maybe in four years, 400 jobs paying $14 an hour. It takes my breath away. But here's the lesson, the big one. That's how capitalism works. If it's profitable to leave the United States and go to a place like China, they do it. And they'll do it for as long as it's profitable. 
But if there's a new technology that they can use, one that might be expensive, but they've had 20 years of boosted profits by producing in China so they can afford it, they can now come back into the United States, employ a small fraction of the people who once had jobs, get a nice fat subsidy out of the public sector to do it, and make even more profits. Because, as the man said, even the cheapest labor market can't compete with us with this technology. What they don't get you by if they bring a poor immigrant to take your job, what they don't get by moving your job to another part of the world where they can pay someone very little, they can get by replacing you with a machine. Whichever one of those is profitable will be pursued. It's a system that is driven by profits. What the consequences are. What are you saying about the future of Arkansas? If you're bringing in jobs at $14 an hour for factory work, what kind of a society do you think you're going to build? What kind of community can sustain itself on that? especially after 20 years of decline. You must be kidding. If this is the best you can do, Mr. Governor of Arkansas, you've basically thrown in the towel on the future economic development of your state, which you were not elected to do. Here's the reality. Of course, if a machine can produce t-shirts much more quickly and efficiently than the old machine, and that you need fewer labor hours to go with that machine than you once did. The humane, the good thing to do, would be to let all the workers have a shorter workday. That's how you would have less work because you don't need it anymore. That's how to make a technical innovation really help people by shortening the work week. You're not doing that. You're laying off people. You're destroying the community. You're just doing it to make more money. And why don't you just be honest and admit that's the system you live in. We know it. Why do you have to fake it? And precisely because it's the system we live in, the problem is the system. And if we don't like these results, and Lord knows I hope you don't, then it's the system that has to be changed. We've come to the end of the first half of this program of Economic Update. Please stay with us. We will be right back. And I think you'll find the interview well worth your attention.